As a stacker, you've probably heard the old mantra that silver and gold are sound money. And there may be truth to that. But have you asked yourself, if that's the case, why did everyone go off the gold standard, particularly the United States? And I think the answer is actually really, really interesting. And it tells you a lot about where we are now and where we are going forward. Because a lot of the things that play into that decision affect where we are today. And they also actually might be kind of surprising to you about the dynamics at work because they're not as straightforward as you would think on the surface. So first of all, I was thinking about this topic recently with regard to why would the United States leave you know, the gold standard, particularly in the 70s where they literally stopped the ability to redeem you know, our fiat currency for gold. And I asked myself, what was different back then to what, you know, to what the United States is now? So first, I look back at that time, we were a manufacturing economy, right? So at that time, we were producing, you know, goods particularly and services for, you know, export. Post-World War II, huge economic powerhouse, the dominant military power in the world. And so we had a lot of pull as far as, you know, production. Now think about that. When you're producing goods, let's say for export, people are paying you let's let's keep it at a sovereign finance level let's say that you know nations are paying the united states in gold bullion right at that time that probably was the case you know so there were settlements made in gold you know to pay for whatever it is resources oil coal whatever but think about that so on the one hand we're sending out you know products and resources and things but we're getting back gold to pay for that so at a certain point especially as the dominant manufacturing power you've accumulated quite a bit of the gold and if that continues again there's you know intrinsic costs to that you have to take care of the gold you have to store the gold security you know all of these different things that come with ship it you know all of these different things now once you turn that off once the united states stopped allowing you to redeem fiat for actual you know metal value and just went to a pure fiat system well then all of that stops there's no more redemption of the gold so if you're holding you know if you're holding all of the gold let's say hypothetically there's no mechanism for it to go back out. Now, can you still do transactions and things like that? You absolutely can. But it doesn't affect your general economy, your fiat-based economy. That's pretty interesting. Okay. So basically, if I'm you know, holding all the value, all the marbles, why would I want to let it go back out for any reason? But here's the other interesting part that tells you a lot about where we are now as a nation. So... Again, you hear a lot of people talk about the national debt. Oh, that we can't just, you know, print endless currency. You know, there, there's a price to be paid for it. And, uh, you know, it's going to lead to disaster. The, you know, we're going to default. We're going to do this, that, and the other thing. Well, I can see where they, they think that. Because, again, they're equating it to, like, household finance. They're equating it to, you know, how you run your, your, your books. And, again, sovereign finance doesn't work like that. But the interesting part is when you think about the United States economy now, we're a service based economy, right? We don't produce anything here. We do, but you know, not like before. We were not a manufacturing economy like we were before. And there are a lot of people that look at that and say, oh, that's, you know, a sign of the, the United States diminished uh, capacity. You know, hey, we're, we're just not the strong power that we were before because we don't make things here. Maybe, maybe. But here's the flip side of that. Because we're a consumption-based economy, because we import far more than we export, particularly with like goods, let's say, the interesting part about that is that we pay for those things in fiat dollars. So for those people, for stackers particularly, who say fiat is worthless, we are paying everyone else for their tangible goods, even these guys, in fiat we are handing them worthless money according to stackers for tangible goods 
Now, why would they allow that to happen if the United States dollar is so worthless? Why would there be such demand for the dollar if it's, you know, it's dying? The BRICs are going to take over. Well, that's another interesting point. So think about this. We've been we've been hearing about BRICs for decades, right? Oh, they're going to be the next, uh, you know, uh, world reserve currency. Saudi Arabia, the economic ninja, was telling me before the pandemic that uh, Russia was going to supply arms to Saudi Arabia because they are the, you know, they're going to protect Saudi Arabia. How do you think that worked out, economic ninja? How do you think, uh, and, and I, I was literally having this conversation with him. He was uh, responding to me in the comments or whoever runs his comments. And uh, it was actually pretty hilarious. I was like, "That's uh, yeah, that's not gonna happen." And he was like, "You don't, you don't know. Russia's a a mighty military power, and you know Saudi Arabia doesn't trust us, so they're gonna go with Russia." How did that work out? You think Saudi Arabia is still looking at Russia to protect them? Probably not, right? But here's the interesting thing with regard to gold and that whole scenario. So with regard to the BRICS nations and, you know, them becoming the world reserve currency, as, as has been predicted by many a stacker, right? Hey, we're going to get knocked off the pedestal. Well, here's the thing. In order to do that, you have to create demand for your money. People have to want your fiat currency. It, it, it just is what it is. They, there has to be a demand for it, meaning that people have to want to accept the yuan for their stuff if that doesn't happen then that whole scenario is never going to come to fruition if no one wants your your if no one wants and no one trusts your fiat currency then there's no way that that concept even gets off the ground now with the united states the way that we have it situated at least currently we have an inherent demand for our dollars because we import so much everyone accepts the dollar not only that on top of that outside the united states the interesting thing is that you know you think about the dollar and you think about the dollar outside the united states and you wonder you know what does what role does it really play outside the united states well that's actually really interesting because if you ask yourself you know what how business is done outside the united states you can use dollar denominated assets such as you know u.s treasuries or things like that that are basically dollars they're dollar denominated debt but they can be exchanged because they're a very uniform asset that you can trade with anybody they're recognized they're easy to transfer there's none of the costs and and you know other aspects associated with the gold let's go back to a gold standard there's none of that you don't have to deal with any of that and you're getting the same type of, you know, easy ease of transaction and whether stackers like it or not, that the reliability of the dollar, that the dollar is going to be there, that the understanding of the dollar is going to be there. Now, does that mean the dollar is going to be around forever? No, it just means that, you know, the, the, the BRICS nations are probably not going to be the ones that, uh, that replace the dollar as the world reserve currency. But the, like I said, the other interesting thing when you think about it is, again, you have to create that demand for your currency, not your goods. And so think about it this way. China is a production economy, right? They produce, you know, all kinds of garbage that we, and not all of it's garbage, is not what I'm saying, but they produce all kinds of different things. They're a manufacturing economy. What do they take in payment for that? They take dollars okay so in order to change that they would have to become a consumption economy they would have to become a service-based economy like us and instead of giving their goods you know to other nations they would have to draw in goods and services and pay with the yuan nobody wants the yuan and that's the big thing with the BRICS nations when you hear about all the issues that they have, that they just can't get it going. They don't want each other's currency. No one wants rupees. No one wants rubles. No one wants the yuan. Why? Why? If they're so tightly connected, why don't you want to accept? Because when things like that happen, ask yourself. Ask yourself, what's really going on there? 
what's really going on when you know you're trading something a good or a service you know for money you're trading something of value and what you get back you have to have instant recognizable recognizability of the value you're getting back why would i want to give away you know my oil and trade it for your possibly very quickly worthless rupee or yuan that is the question that is the issue at hand and that that is why the BRICS nations just won't ever be able to get it off the ground they each recognize that all of them are built on you know castles of sand or pillars of sand excuse me there's no, there isn't the stability the recognizability of something like the dollar and how are you going to convince someone else to accept your currency when it's built on such shaky foundation that is the real key that is the real thing that people dismiss and don't understand now the other interesting part about it is when you think about the u.s national debt when you think about well why is the debt you know constantly increasing constantly increasing well think about what that's really doing it's creating demand for dollars every time debt is created in dollar denominated terms it has to be paid back in dollars you are creating inherent demand endless demand for dollars so as you know it as the game continues that the world accepts the dollar and understands that the dollar and again this isn't just you know the government other countries businesses they do business in dollars not exclusively obviously but widely and so as they do that that creates more in his in inherent demand for the dollar the, do the those type of debts have to be paid back in dollars so as the debt expands more dollars need to be created to service the debt that i mean when you look at it that way increasing the debt's actually a necessary evil it ensures the survival of the dollar it ensures that hey there's going to be a demand for the dollar now let's look at it the other direction let's say for example you know all the other countries or many countries decided you know what we're just not gonna you know use debt denominated in dollars what would happen then how would that work out what would be the you know what would be the impact of something like that well let's say u.s treasuries for example if u.s treasuries just uh, mature and then they go back, you know, they're, they're not reissued because there isn't the demand for the debt. Well, then, by definition, that makes the dollar even stronger. It actually deflates the dollar and makes them stronger because now there's not as many in circulation. Now, the demand has, has let, you know, has let up. But the dollar would be stronger because you're decreasing the supply. Interesting. Interesting very interesting and again one of the many deep conversations i mean you could go all the way down the rabbit hole obviously with a topic like that but one of the many reasons that when you see things like you know that are very topical like the national debt oh my god we need to have a yes we should be fiscally responsible but not in terms of like looking at the actual number of the debt what we're spending our money on that's what you know obviously should get attention but people get so captivated by narratives and things that just you know they that they can't comprehend and i think that's one of the big things i'm not sure if that's i'm assuming that's not a new thing obviously i'm not old enough to uh see have seen previous generations but i think you know the last couple of generations were probably especially here in the united states were brought up with an idea of you know understanding complex concepts that they really don't you know, I mean, we're all guilty of that, right? We're all guilty of, of uh, you know, having something to say about things that we don't understand. But I think it's especially prevalent here. And when you get, you know, when things like the national debt or this and that, you know, that the debt ceiling or other things like that, that really the, the average person doesn't really have any concept of. They, they, they think they do. They have preconceived notions about what it entails, but they don't really understand these are the things that like I said when you really dive into the details there's a lot more at work than you could ever possibly fathom and that's what makes sound money such an interesting concept